Let me start by going to the blackboard here. And uh, I want to just mention that uh, this uh, segment is number two, which is uh, the psychology of biblical study. And then we could say the need for carefulness. The need for carefulness. Obviously, with the matter of authenticity, there are things we can do. Prayer, uh, general reading of the Bible, journaling, small groups, counseling, uh, accountability partners. Uh, there are things we can do. And in the reading for uh, Module 2, uh, there are many suggestions uh, for doing just that. But uh, I'd like to go a little bit deeper into the psychology side of this because I think that can be helpful to us. The root of this problem of self-deception, it seems to me, is in what psychology calls defense mechanisms. And the defense mechanisms uh, are natural to us. Uh, let, me, let me give an example of a defense mechanism. Let's suppose, uh, so any of you ever hear of Randy Johnson? Uh, Randy Johnson was a baseball pitcher. I think he's probably retired now. But he was about six foot ten, and his arm, you know, was like eight feet long. It was this big old arm, and uh, he'd throw the ball 101 miles an hour, and it would come like from first base, you know. So if a person was a left-hand batter, it was like the ball was coming right over his head, over the plate, you know. So it was absolutely unhittable just about half the time. Well, just imagine that uh, Randy Johnson were to walk into the room. Uh, right now and that I were to say that uh, not only was he tall and very fast, he was also rather ugly. Uh, and he takes offense at this comment and he launches a 101 mile an hour fastball at my nose. Okay, what am I going to do at that point? Obviously, would I have to think about it? No. Would I have to plan? Now, Randy Johnson has just launched a 101 mile an hour fastball toward my nose. Evasive action called for. You know, too late. You see. Yet there's something deep down inside us that is very protective of our physical body. Just like that, I, I couldn't even th possibly think about. It. I would be able to block that response instantly. It would just know that it's there. That's defense mechanisms. Physically, we know that very, very strongly. But psychologically, mentally, emotionally, defense mechanisms are there as well. And uh, a definition that I've put together for defense mechanisms from several psychological writings are, when things go wrong, we have ways to deceive ourselves about reality so we can avoid feeling bad about ourselves. When things go wrong, when life gets tough, we have ways to deceive ourselves about reality so we can avoid feeling bad about ourselves. Now, a defense mechanism that many people use is alcohol. Because alcohol enables us to be clouded to reality so that we can feel okay. And defense mechanisms don't require substances. You know, substances are just one way we can consciously do that. But unconsciously, we have many ways to deaden the pain and uh, to, to deceive ourselves as needed so things don't seem as bad as they actually are. Uh, to give you some examples of this, uh, one example, there's maybe 40 of them, but one of them is devaluation. And devaluation is simply that by constantly criticizing other people, by reducing their value in our eyes, we become relatively more valuable in our own eyes. So 
devaluation is when you're constantly putting other people down so that in the process you may seem relatively at least uh, a little bit more valuable. It's not something that one thinks about. It's not something one plans to do. And if you're, if you're a Christian, you probably don't ever plan to be hurtful to other people. And then at the end of the day, you look back and you say, whoops, where'd that come from? Defense mechanisms. You'll see. By being critical of others, we deflect our own attention from similar problems in ourselves. And that's why the scripture actually says that the one who points out flaws in others has it all the more themselves. We see most clearly the flaws in others that we ourselves share. And uh, that, I think, is a pretty solid uh, psychological observation. Another example of a defense mechanism is displacement. And displacement is when we may be upset at one person and we end up taking it out on someone else. For example, uh, you may be angry with your boss. So who gets it? The spouse back home. You, you can't talk to your boss. You're afraid of your boss. You might lose your job. So you can't respond back how you really feel. So you go home and you holler at your spouse. And maybe the spouse is a little bit afraid of you, so they don't talk back, they holler at the kids. And the kids maybe are afraid to respond, so they go kick the dog. And the only way to bring justice in the situation is if you have your boss over for dinner and the dog bites him. You see, and now everybody's even, <laughs> and we can start all over again. You see, but that's displacement. And displacement is when, uh, instead of dealing with the situation at hand, we react to somebody else in the light of a larger context that they don't even know about. And once again, we don't do this by intention. We don't wake up one morning and say, I'm so mad at my boss, I'm going to kill my kids. You know, no, we don't do that consciously. But subconsciously, uh, defense mechanisms operate. And, uh, and somehow, there's some inner sense of justice that is served by this very unjust uh, kind of behavior. Uh, another example of defense mechanism, I'll give you only three, uh, and some of you may know many, many more. But another one that kind of fascinates me a bit is sublimation. Sublimation, which as, as I think the word implies, you kind of bury something underground. So one way to deal with issues is to just hide it in the ground, to bury it. And in practice, what that means is if you have an unacceptable urge inside, something inside that you just know is wrong, that you find some socially acceptable way to live that out. In other words, you know that if you have a murderous anger towards your father and you act on it, you'll end up in jail or worse. So, and again, this isn't conscious or intentional, but people who carry such things may go elsewhere. They may become hunters, never tying the two things together. They may become football players. I remember a young man that uh, my family uh, knows really, really well. And he grew pretty big pretty early. When he was 12, he was six foot two and 230 pounds. And the league he played in was terrified of him because he was twice the size of everybody else. And he would hit home runs as rapidly as anyone else would get singles. Uh, so uh, they didn't want to pitch to him. They didn't want to play with him, et cetera. Um, he then went into football. And in high school, he grew up to six foot five and 300 pounds. And uh, he was considered uh, at graduation the greatest 
a football player in the history of his state. And the news article was very interesting because they said he is the sweetest, most mild-mannered kid you'd ever want to know. But when he gets on the field, an animal rage comes over him. And out of this animal rage, he absolutely flattened everybody. In his, he was a defensive lineman. He'd flatten everybody in his way to get to the quarterback, the running back, whoever had the ball, and he was unstoppable. Animal rage. You know. Where did that come from? I don't know in this particular case. But clearly something was going on there. There's a sublimation going on. This, this anger was out of proportion to the situation. It may have been a useful anger, but the anger at this player that he doesn't even know is not an anger that's focused on the situation. It's come from somewhere else. Some people even go into surgery. That's almost humorous, almost. But out of that, again, we don't, do we know the motives of what we do, even half the time? And uh, there are a lot of people that wouldn't go into surgery, period, because uh, there's something about it that, uh, that is, is, is almost repulsive to natural people, and yet for a mission it can become a necessary thing and a, and a beautiful thing. And I'm not suggesting every surgeon, or even most surgeons, are in this category. The point is sublimation is deceiving yourself into thinking that I'm dealing with the issue over here, when in actual fact uh, you're dealing with something else uh, entirely. From everything that I've studied, defense mechanisms are automatic. We don't plan to deceive our heads, ourselves ahead of time. They happen. Uh, they're unconscious. We rarely know our innermost motives. And we don't want to know for fear that we'll find something that produces guilt or lowers our self-esteem. You know? So defense mechanisms are automatic and unconscious. Does that apply to Bible reading? What do you think? Do defense mechanisms operate when you're reading the Bible? And how, do, how does that happen? Well, you always you think about the other person. You know, you read something about you shouldn't do this, and you think about your spouse. Or you think about people that you don't like while well, they're doing it. You know, so this would be, they really should be reading this. It's mm. a defense mechanism saying they're the ones who have the problems instead of looking at me. Mm. Very well put. Yeah, I remember we were talking, we were debating about Paul's, Paul's writings, and one of them he had said that if, I've forgotten what he actually said, but if a, a woman is divorced, whoever married her, was um, or was also as guilty as something something like that. Mm -hmm. One of those things. And the, the person, my my mate at school, who found that and ran to tell me what's going through that kind of thing. So he said, "Look, look at this. Look at it." And that kind of thing. So I mean, like they found something that was wrong. With mm -hmm. um, so I think that, that that's how it works. When you find something in the Bible that it speaks to something that you think you know, you were going through. First thing you do is to think that it's either wrong or that something is you mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Defense mechanisms relevant to hermeneutics. Have you ever sat down to read the Bible and about 15 minutes later? It dawns on you, you can't remember a thing you've read. You, you've gone several pages, <laughs> it's all a blank. I think that's defense mechanisms more often than not. You come to something, there's something in there that triggers and says, whoa, you know. And you go on by and then say, oh, what, what was that? What did I read? I don't quite remember. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I guess the question that comes in, 
is there a way to read the Bible? You know, we can, we can do authentic prayer, we can do journaling, we can do small groups, we can do all that as a part of it. And I don't want to minimize that at all. And I think anybody who really wants to understand the Bible uh, probably will wish to do a lot of, uh, of that kind of work. And I think uh, all of you are probably committed to that kind of work or you wouldn't be in this course. But is there a way to study the Bible? Can, is there a hermeneutic that will truly enable us to, uh, to break through some of these barriers? Is there a way to read the Bible that avoids some of the defense mechanisms that might otherwise kick into place? I remember uh, my cousin married a Pentecostal minister. She was a Seventh-day Adventist. He was Pentecostal. And uh, I, I sometimes joked that uh, she made an Adventist out of him and he made a Christian out of her. And so it was win-win. <laughs> and uh, one day, uh, perhaps you're aware, but Pentecostal ministers usually don't do much in the way of education. They're, they sort of charismatically rise up from the ranks, so to speak. And if they're doing some good, people affirm that and just you know, put them in the pulpit and so on. So he, he learned that I was teaching uh, at the seminary in Andrews University. And he says, uh, what do you teach there? And I said, I teach exegesis. And he said, what's that? <laughs> I said, well, how am I going to explain this <laughs> in one sentence or less? And here's the sentence I came up with, and I was joking at the time. And the more I thought about it, the more I said, that is a pretty good definition of exegesis. And let me write it on the board here. All right. Uh, exegesis, as I put it to him, exegesis is the process of learning how to read the Bible in such a way as to leave open the possibility that you might learn something. Let me, let me write it down. So, exegesis is the process of learning how to read the Bible in such a way as to leave open the possibility to leave open the possibility that you might learn something. Now let's just look at that for just a moment there. Exegesis is a process. You don't want to leave the impression that when you've done a little exegesis, you've got the text. You've mastered it. No. Uh, when you've done a little exegesis, you're completely open to wherever the Bible will lead you. No. It's a process. Learning how to read the Bible is a process. And to read it in such a way as to leave open the possibility you might learn something. I think most of us study the Bible to confirm what we already believe. We want to prove where we are. That you, you shared, you've opened your heart to us on some of that. How, how we can be used to a system. We say, I don't want to go further. But is there a way to continually open our hearts to the Bible, uh, to the place where we are learning from the text. Is there a strategy that we can do that can assist all the other authenticity work that we might be doing? Uh, the CPE, whatever else is going on in your life. Is there a way that we can approach the Bible that will bypass some of the defense mechanisms and leave open the possibility we might learn something? That is what exegesis is all about to me. 
And uh, in the next module, uh, module three, uh, we're going to explore uh, three different ways that people approach the Bible and uh, focus particularly on the issue of exegesis as a method for bypassing some of the defense mechanisms in our heart and enabling us to see what the Bible is actually saying. And uh, so that, uh, that to me is the reason why we do exegesis. Uh, for some, the reason is simply to determine historically you know, what the Bible meant. But for me, exegesis is critical to letting the Bible change me, letting the Bible upset my apple cart. And uh, I'll explain uh, as we go along in some detail on that. What do you think of that definition? Would you change it in any way? It's a practical definition. It's not, not attempting to uh, you know, be theoretically sound or something like that. But for me, I, that's what I shared with my Pentecostal cousin. <laughs> I just said, well, you know, there are ways to read the Bible that simply affirm what you already know or what you already believe. But there are ways to challenge who you are and, and force you into perspectives that you wouldn't have done otherwise. Because what came to me when I heard exegesis was, good, now I will learn how to preach to them. Mm -hmm. But I didn't think of how it's going to change me. Mm -hmm. So I, I like that. It begins with my heart being open to mm -hmm. receive change in me. And that will spill out to others. Yeah, if it's changed you, then there's some hope it might change others as well. If the, if the truth that we learn doesn't change us, there's probably not much use to anybody else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's take a break.